As Nick said, um, we sing with passion. Like this room kind of rumbles a little bit sometimes, especially with an anthem that you know we kind of connect with. And, and the reason for that, like the, that passion that maybe if you're new to church or haven't been in church in a while, if you feel that, like we believe those words. We believe in Jesus and that he is the only way back to the Father and that he can change our lives. So it's just awesome for you guys to be here in second service. I want to start with a story. Um, and by the way, if we haven't met yet, my name is Anthony, and um, it, was, it was 2000, the year 2000, the turn of the millennium, and uh, uh, I was 18 years old, and one of my favorite things to do as an 18-year-old, I, I, was, I think I was still in high school at this time, it was kind of spring, early spring or something of that year, and one of my favorite things to do was to cruise through town uh, in my beautiful, luxurious, every, every 18-year-old's dream car, my 1988 Grand Am two-door coupe, pewter gray. That's a beautiful piece of machinery right there. And uh, that, that, that's not my car, actually. I, I, had, I had to find a Google image of the car. Uh, and yeah, it wasn't much, but it had a moonroof, and it would go zero to 60 once in a while. I mean, that car was great. So uh, I went on my first date with my wife, now my wife, uh, to Steak and Shake in that car. That's a true story. That's where you go in the 1988 Grand Am. But I, I was so proud of this car, I put a front end cover on it. You know what that is, right? A front end cover. Like it, it's like a superhero mask for cars. It's you know, turns your car into Zorro, pretty much, and um, except, for I, except for I put it on this car, again, uh, the, that, yeah, so you can just use your imagination. I couldn't find a Google image with uh, a Grand Am with a front, or a, a superhero mask. Anyway, so I, anyway, I'm at work, and my friend calls um, to, and asks to borrow my car. Um, th- this particular friend didn't have a car, and we were pretty good friends. I like this guy, and um, I'm, so I'm a nice guy. I, I said, sure, you can borrow my car, and um, uh, just come up here. I'm working right now. Just come up and get the keys from me here at work. And just, just a quick aside, um, and I, I, you're probably with me on this. How many of you, like when you lend something out, when you let somebody borrow something of yours, especially like a car, you expect it back in as good or better condition than when you let them borrow it? You, anybody with me on that? Yeah, a lot of us. Yeah, put some gas in that thing or take it through the car wash or something. So that'll make more sense in a minute. So he meets me at uh, Martin's. That's where I worked at. uh, And uh, to borrow my 1988 Pewter Gray Grand Am two-door coupe with a moonroof and a black LeBron on the front. And and when he got there, when he got there, I explained, you know, there's some things you need to know about the car. You got to give it some gas to get it started sometimes. And um, that the 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 line that kind of shows if you're in park or reverse or it's a little off. So it shows that you're in neutral, but you're actually in drive. Just so just relax. And um, the heater doesn't work, but bring a blanket and have a blast. Okay, take it. Uh, And it was about 11 a.m. I said I get off at work at four. You know, be be back by four. About an hour later, he comes walking back in the front end of Martin's supermarket, and I can tell by the look on his face, something's wrong. So he walks up to me, I'm bagging groceries, and he's like, hey, uh, so I'm back, <laughs> you want to come check out the car before I give you the keys back? I'm like, I don't need to check out the car, just give me the, I'm, I'm working here, I can't take a break whenever I want, you know, I'm doing some important stuff, so just give me the key. He's like, well, you might, you might just want to come do a quick look around before... I give the keys back, so I'm like, you better not have scratched the LeBra. I paid $100 at AutoZone for that thing. So anyway, so I go out of the parking lot, get about halfway to uh, the car, and you, you know how when you see something shocking and, and time kind of slows down and you have all these thoughts running through your brain at the same time? And that, that's what happened, and I, I was thinking, is this real? Like, is what I'm seeing, is this really, like, this happened? And, and the other thought I'm having at the same time is, I wouldn't mind if this truck backed into my friend right now. Just, just, it wouldn't bother me at all. So uh, we, we continue walking. And the reason for my shock was that, yes, my car was back in the parking lot, and it was now taking up two parking spaces. And I'm, I don't mean he was parking, like, long ways or in the middle of two spots. I mean that parking spot number one was the majority of the body of the car, and parking spot number two was the bumper and right driver's side front fender laying on the asphalt, just laying there. 
And I found out about how everything went down. And I don't, I mean, it's not that great of a story. You can, a few people ask me after first service, so how'd that happen? I'll tell you if you want to know. But my expectation of returning the car in as good or better condition than when I let him borrow it was not exactly met. Uh, and the good news is that with, with two rolls of duct tape and that front end cover, I was able to attach the bumper back, and it lasted for a few more months till the transmission eventually went out. But, and I think I, I did at least get an I'm sorry, man, from my friend. So that eased the pain a little bit. But, but I wanted to start with that story because as we talked about last week, God has the same expectations for us when it comes to our health and our physical bodies that I had for my friend in loaning out my 1988 Grand Am. And this is the foundation we laid last week for this series, that our body is on loan to us from God. It's not ours. Jesus paid a great price to save us, the whole, the whole us. We'll see this in just a second. We are stewards of this body and our health. And we, we talked about how our body and our health is a gift from God, and He is honored, God is honored, when we take care of it. That was simply what we talked about, and then we kind of got into some practical stuff. I'll explain that. But here's where that comes from, and here's kind of the simple teaching of Scripture when it comes to our body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? And that's where we got the name of this series. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And three big things that we got from those two verses. Number one, your body is a temple. Number two, Jesus paid a great price to save you, the whole you, spirit, soul, mind, and body, every part. He gave up his life on a cross to save every part of us. And then number three, that he is honored when we take care of our body. And after we kind of laid that foundation, the basic teaching of Scripture when it comes to our bodies, we started to discover, okay, then how do we do this? How do we honor God with this temple? What does it look like? And so we started to work through an acronym for the word energy. And we're going to get into that a little bit more today. And the reason we chose the word energy is because here's the big idea of this series. If we remember something after January, after this series, I want it to be this. The energy is the outcome of honoring God with our bodies. That's what God wants for us. God wants to give us energy to accomplish the things he has for us to accomplish on this planet. He wants us to be healthier, happier, and have the energy we need to live out our faith to the best of our ability in this limited time we have in this earth suit we call a body. So following Jesus is the best way to live. We talk about that all the time at Revolution, and this is what he wants for us, energy. So we, we received the first two letters of that acronym last week. We found out that the E stands for eat. Because nothing determines how much energy we have or don't have, and nothing you know, kind of shows God how honoring we are to this body more than what we put in it, the food that we eat. And we talked about going from the rallies plan to the Daniel plan, if you were here. Maybe you were, if not, you can check it out online. Um, and, then, uh, and then the second letter we got was the N. It stands for notice. We got to notice the stressors and triggers that attempt to take us back to kind of undisciplined living in, in so many ways. So that's kind of, that's, that's where we started last week with, the, with this series. And, and something we didn't get into that I think is really good to talk about um, as we move into a couple more of the letters, kind of in the messy middle today, that's the name of the talk. But I, I, this is so important, I think, for this series to kind of just bring this information into the middle of this series. Our genes... Not denim like Levi's. Our, our DNA. Our DNA comes into play in a series like this. And I just, I just want to kind of bring this into the series. I understand that some of the health conditions and the problems we have in and with our bodies are not because of choices. Now, some of them are, of course. But we all have, many of them are not. We all have genetic advantages and, and genetic deficiencies And maybe a few of us got the luck of the draw when it comes to the gene pool. And we got like the Lamborghini version of the body. And and like it doesn't matter what you eat. You just seem to burn it off. You got like the highest metabolism imaginable. And every time you go to the doctor, you get this clean bill of health. And and it's just, and you look 10 years younger than you actually are. And everybody hates you because you got the Lamborghini version. Many others of us, we got the 1988 Grand Am. And we have to meticulously change the oil and kind of watch things and, and, and be really careful or something could break down on this body that we have. So, and and really, here's the deal. Really, there are things that we are all dealt from the gene pool that we really can't control. 
Some of us wear glasses or contacts. Some people wear hearing aids. Some people, simply because of a genetic makeup, struggle with high cholesterol or high blood pressure or blood sugar. And research has even been done to show that genetics also relates to weight loss and muscle building. For some people, it's just easier. You, you know some of these people, you're thinking about them. And, and, and how, we, how we take care of our temples, it matters, okay? It still matters. But simply because the gene pool dealt us the grand dam instead of the Lamborghini, we're never going to be Logan Sports' version of Arnold Schwarzenegger or Jillian Michaels or, you know, whoever, right? It's just not going to happen. So what I'm saying is, here, here's, here's why this is so important. We've all been dealt a hand when it comes to our health and our bodies, Sin entered the gene pool thousands of years ago, and no one is ever born with perfect DNA, okay? So just because we follow this acronym in this series, it doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect, and you're going to have unlimited energy, and you're going to be perfectly healthy, okay? No, we're, we're just shooting for better. We're just, we're just, that's what Jesus asked of his followers, that, that we will do the very best we can with this body, this temple that he's given us. And, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is so central to what we, what we really proclaim at Revolution about following Jesus, that, that Jesus doesn't expect perfect. He expects progress. That we'll, just, we'll work a little bit today, be a little better today than we were yesterday, a little bit better tomorrow than we are today. So again, there's no judgment or shame in this series. I don't want anybody walking through the town like comparing and judging and nobody needs that, right? So we, we've all been dealt a genetic hand and we all have work to do, okay? We're not shooting for perfect. We're shooting for progress. So with all that in mind, let's get into the messy middle of the acronym for energy. And you've probably already guessed, whoops, you've probably already guessed what the next E stands for. Anybody want to just take a stab at it and just yell it out? What do, you, what do you think the next E stands for? Anybody want to try? Yes, exercise. You guys have been thinking ahead. Yeah, you're really excited now, aren't you? Exercise. And, and look, I, I've seen the memes, okay? I, I've seen the, the jokes about this. Let me just give you a few of them, okay? My exercise routine consists of doing diddly squats. That's, that's funny. That's not what we're going for, though, okay? This is, this is my favorite one. Look, check this out. Somebody got that a little bit late in the back. That's great. Instead of the John, I call my bathroom the gym. That way it sounds better when I say I go to the gym first thing every morning. You can use that. That's clever. That's good stuff. And then last one, I uh, got up to 40 minutes on the exercise bike. Next week, I'm going to be, I'm going to try turning the pedals. Like, that's what I use mine for, right? And we can have some fun with this because here's what Scripture says about today's topic or the first letter of today that we're going to look at. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 4.8. Physical exercise has some value, but spiritual exercise is valuable in every way because it promises life both for the present and for the future. And, and before you say like, oh, see, that's why I pray and read my Bible instead of exercising. I, I, I do what's more important, right? Let, let, let me kind of explain what this is saying, all right? This is saying that today's talk is not the most important talk I've ever given at Revolution. Okay? I think it's more important in the 21st century than it was in the 1st century because of culture, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But there's other topics. What this is saying is there's other topics that God would consider higher on the value spectrum. Our spiritual life is ultimately more important. The condition of our spirit and soul is more important but that doesn't mean our physical body doesn't matter. The exercise doesn't matter. This has some value. And, and as we said last week, look, the, the body and the soul are not disconnected, completely separate. How we operate with our body, how we take care of our body affects our soul, uh, affects our spiritual being. So this has value is what, what this verse is saying. And, but maybe you're like, but Jesus didn't go to the gym, Anthony. Okay, I'm a Jesus follower. I follow Jesus. Jesus did not have a membership to the YMCA, so that's why I don't. And, and yes, and Jesus walked everywhere he went. It is estimated that with the stories we have of Jesus in the Bible, scholars estimate he walked 3,200 miles in his less than three years of ministry. That's about three miles a day. So on average, Jesus did a 5K every day. And that's just, that's just like traveling town to town, stories we have. That's not even the stories that we don't have accounted for in the Gospels. So there's no need for Jesus to wear a Fitbit, right? He's, he's getting more steps in by noon than we're getting in a whole day, most of us. And, and even before his ministry, he worked in a profession that kept his body moving. Jesus was a carpenter, probably did some of that during his ministry as well. See, our culture is different today. 
Some of us still have jobs that are physically demanding, but many of us do not. A lot of us work in a chair or have a job that doesn't require much from us physically. And without a physically demanding job or intentional, regular exercise, we're neglecting one of the things that our body was created to do. Move. Like our body needs, it craves movement. And like doing exercise pretty consistently now for several years, like when I don't do it for a week or two, like it's like my muscles and cells are screaming out for something. Like you got to move, you got to do something. And, and, and at this point, maybe, maybe you're thinking, but Anthony, you're young, okay? This is, this is a good message for you because, I mean, you're young-ish still and you got, you got movement still and all your ligaments are kind of still working and all that. So this makes sense for you, but... I don't know about for me. First, here's the thing. I usually don't have energy when I go to work out. But I get way more energy from it, like from the movement. It's just kind of, especially mentally, it just, my mind seems clearer. And it just, it, it, if we do it in a balanced way, it's a, it's a giver of energy rather than taking it away. If we do it in a balanced way. So, and, and here's, the, here's the other thing. There are people at Revolution that are a couple decades older than me that could smoke me in a distance race. I, in, in two more decades, they'll still be able to smoke me in a distance race. It's, it's not so much about age as it is about discipline. Uh, the workout place I go to, uh, the other day I was doing the elliptical, and um, there was a guy next to me, I would guess probably in his 80s, tearing that thing up. And it made me work. I'm like, I, I am not going to let a guy that could be my grandpa do me on the elliptical. So I'm going to town too, and I, I got more of a workout that day than the whole week, right? Um, I, I read this article. I read this article, it's, it's entitled, Sitting is the New Smoking. Here, here's just a couple quotes from the article. I just want you to think about this, and it's not near as scary as it sounds. It's really challenging. It says, inactivity is killing people and is arguably one of the greatest threats of our time. The World Health Organization asserts that physically, or physical inactivity constitutes the fourth leading cause of death globally, causing an estimated 3.2 million deaths around the world. From the driver's seat to the office chair and then the couch at home, Americans are spending more time seated than ever, and researchers say it's wreaking havoc on our body. Sitting is the new smoking. Because we live in a different culture. Most of us, many of us probably sit at our jobs. We sit when we travel somewhere. We're, when we're driving somewhere. We sit when we're going to binge watch a whole season of Stranger Things on Netflix. You know, we sit. We, we sit for so many different things. And we have to get back to moving. And getting that endorphin high, our body was made for this. And, and, and again, we got all kinds of excuses, age or you know, things like that. But it's not as much about age as it is about discipline. Uh, here, I want to put this on the screen. We have to choose what we want most over what we want now. That's what discipline is. It's choosing, and all these different things we've, we're talking about, this matters. We have to choose what we want most over what we want now. And, and discipline is actually where we get the word disciple. We're a disciple of Jesus, a disciplined person that chooses what we want most over what we want now. And, and you have to go into exercise with the right goals and the right expectations. You, you have to get rid of the expectation that after I work out three days a week for a month, you know, I'm going to look like Dwayne Johnson, or that ain't going to happen, or, or I, after a month, I, I want to run a marathon, okay? Those are, the fun, goals are fine. Goals like that are great, but it's not really about that. It's, it's about taking care of the body that is on loan to us from God and having energy for doing his work in this world. It's about honoring God with our bodies, having a high view of the temple, and doing all we can to maximize its effectiveness on earth. And just like last week with eating, I'm, I'm not telling anybody how to exercise. You've got to figure this out. Maybe, maybe it's as simple for you as, like, instead of driving aimlessly around the Walmart parking lot to find that close spot, and kind of like waiting, you know, for the person to back out and wasting 10 minutes, to, like, just park in the first available spot and get a couple hundred steps in. You're going to save time, you're going to save hours of your life by doing this, and you're going to get a bunch of steps in walking up to the front door. So maybe it's as simple as that. Maybe you've got stairs at home and you're just doing those every, uh, every day intentionally, a few times a day. Uh, one of the things that's changed for me over the last year, year and a half is, and I read some stuff, listened to some stuff about the health benefits of a stand-up desk. So I have a, a bar table. I didn't want to buy one. I just got a bar table and put it in my office, and uh, my back feels better now. I, I stay more alert. I, I'll go walk for, and then come back. It just, it's made a huge difference for me. I, I mean, maybe try that. Uh, maybe you get a gym membership, and you get some consistency. You get a plan. 
Uh, maybe you go hiking or uh, biking when, when the weather breaks. It's at least not going to be that cold today. So maybe something like that. I don't know. But, but you've got to choose an exercise that you at least kind of like. Because if you don't like it at all, you're probably not going to stick with it. And so we're, we're going to show you a little one-minute video that, that shows what it looks like to, to enjoy exercise. And this is going to help us transition from the E to the R. But this is what it looks like to enjoy exercise. Maybe you get an idea from this video. We're going to do some jazzercise that'll keep you fit and smiling, sugar. In your life? Swing that off. There you go. Smile, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Here we go. Feel that beat. We're going to play a little b-ball now. You, me, and all of us jazzercisers together. Here we go. Yeah, got to strut your stuff. That's good. You take it out, dad, in, aha, uh-huh. all right, I do it again, that's nice. Come on, a little dribbling right here. Way down, you take it up and back. Aha, uh-huh. take it down. All right, all right. Oh, yeah. Again now, baby, do it. You got to do it with us, yeah. It's fun. You're good. Feels good. Look it. Now's the time. You gotta get up and boogie with this, honey. Yeah. You gotta find that boogie body. Okay. That's good. Looks good. Feel the beat. Oom chicka, oom chicka, oom chicka, oom chicka, oom chicka. Now take it to the right. The left. Bum, 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 bum. Find it. Feel it. Do it. All right. Yeah. Got to move your boogie body. Come on and shake those hips. Move that boogie body, yeah! It's okay, move that boogie body. Come on, take it up, take it up, take it down, take it down, take it up, take it up, take it up, take it up. Now, here we go to circle them. Oh, we're here to let you know. So now if we can all stand, we're going to go ahead and do it. I'm kidding. We already got an ab workout from that one, right? That's free on YouTube. You can, we'll, we'll post that on social media. Feel free to use that this week. I mean, yes, that is enjoying exercise is what that's called. Okay, well, let's transition to the fourth letter, the R. And the R stands for rest. So with, with the letters we filled in from last week and this week, we have eat, notice, exercise, and rest. And we're going to get the final two next week, probably the most important two, so don't miss that. And, and rest, isn't, it's not just about sleep, but I want to start there. How are you doing with sleeping? Now, I want you to think about your own sleep habits. I'm going to ask several questions and, and just kind of answer these for yourself to yourself. When was the last time you drifted off to sleep easily, slept soundly all night, and woke up feeling refreshed and alert? And, and maybe that's you consistently. Maybe that's just how it is. Maybe not. When was the last time you hopped out of bed in the morning raring to go? And you're like, that has nothing to do with sleep. That's my job. That's why I don't want I don't. But maybe it has something to do with sleep. When was the last time you sat down to watch a movie and didn't nod off about halfway through? And, and if you're starting to sense a pattern with those answers, let, let me get really up close and personal. Do you have a consistent time you go to sleep, especially in the weekdays? Are you sleeping in a bed? Is that bed comfortable? Do you have a good pillow? And you're like, man, some of that costs money, Anthony. What are you going to... We get, you got, like sponsorship here or what? No. So let me, give us, let me give a few questions that actually save us money. Maybe we can buy the pillow, okay? Do you drink two or less cups of caffeinated beverages like coffee per day? Do you quit drinking coffee by noon? Do you know how I answered those two questions? I'll give you my answer in Spanish. No. <laughs> and, and just think about how this all relates. Like when we don't sleep well, what do we do? Drink more caffeine. And when we drink caffeine, what, what don't we do? We don't sleep well. And when we don't sleep well multiple days in a row, what do we get? Grumpy. And when we get grumpy, what do we do? Things that are not good to our body. We don't eat good or we take substances that we shouldn't you know, overindulge with and things like that. One of the hidden triggers to overeating is lack of sleep. And not that caffeine is like evil and coffee's bad. I will be drinking coffee till the day I die probably. I love coffee. But I'm just working. Everything's got to be disciplined. Everything has to be disciplined and kind of under control. 
Here, here's one of the biggest struggles for me when it comes to sleep. And this happened so often last year. I'm, I'm making some goals for this year with my sleep, and this is one of them. But um, kind of the pattern for me would be, you know, lay down in bed. My, my wife and I would maybe have a conversation, and then, and then I would pull out the cell phone. And the last thing I would do before I went to sleep is scroll through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. I would do social media crack cocaine and then try to go to bed. It doesn't work. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so much. And maybe for you, you just fill in social media with the evening news. Like one of the last things is you're getting the news and, hey, nukes are coming. The apocalypse has started, you know, hide out in the basement. You know what? And then you try to go to sleep. No wonder we, we're not sleeping well. Um, we, we have to train our brains to turn off. We, we need to have a process of turning off the brain at night. A practical thing I read about this week was just taking five to ten minutes of kind of releasing things that are on our mind before we go to sleep, either by writing things down that maybe we don't want to forget about tomorrow or just some anxious thoughts, praying those things to God, like, God, just help me to release this to you, talking with our spouse, maybe calling somebody, you know, releasing it. If we don't have some sort of release, the brain will continue replaying the list subconsciously and more than likely will wake up at some point in the middle of the night thinking about something on that list. And again, sleep is a huge factor when it comes to our health and, and you know, energy levels of our temple. If we're not getting adequate sleep, our brain and body are at risk. And I, I know, again, just with, with all these things we talk about, we're all different. But scientists have discovered that there is an absolute minimum for the adult body. I read a few different articles on this this week. And adults who get less than 6.5 hours, that's, that's really the absolute minimum, 6.5 hours of sleep a night, have lower activity in the prefrontal cortex and temporal lobes, lobes, which are involved in memory and learning. It affects our ability to problem solve, pay attention, and remember important information. You're like, oh, that's what's wrong with me. Okay, maybe, maybe right? I mean, sleep is so important, and we can get too much of it, too. But rest isn't just about sleep. It's about balancing our life. There's been so much research done on, on getting the most out of our energy and our time. And, and unlike some Christ followers, and you've probably noticed this if you've been coming for this series or months or whatever, I really enjoy like reading stuff about social experiments and kind of test subjects and interviewing a lot, you know, hundreds of people and finding out results and things. Uh, I, I've shared this before. I, I'm not a professional pastor in the sense that I have a seminary degree. I, I have lots of credits from a seminary, but I finished my degree in sociology at Indiana University. So I love this kind of stuff, and it, it speaks to me a lot. And there's been so much research done on kind of energy and getting the most out of our bodies and it shows, some of, some of the research shows that whether the work you do is physical or cognitive, physical or mental, there's a point where bodies and minds start to fatigue, and the work we do after that point is not our best work. For cognitive endeavors, it's, it's between 90 minutes and two hours. It's hard to do high-quality, deep-focused work for more than two hours at a time. You, you have to transition the brain to something else, or, or the work you're doing after that two hours, it's simply not going to be your best. And five-hour energy, despite the commercials, doesn't solve this, okay? The only thing that solves it is either taking a break or, or transitioning to something else. We've got to think on something else, go, kind of a different category, different uh, area. And I, I discovered this a couple years ago with preparing the messages for Sunday. I used to try to cram it into two days and just kind of pound my head against the wall and like, God, why aren't you speaking or why can't I figure out what you want to say? And it would be you know, grinding and hard and it would be difficult to cram it. What I do now is I, every day for about 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes in the afternoon, I'm just working on the message all week long now, kind of dividing up the time. It just it seems like God speaks clear. It seems like my mind is clear to kind of hear and understand. It just, and, and if you're a college student or a teenager, think about how, that, how that, that affects you. Like cramming, it's just not the best use of our bodies and our time and our energy and all that. It, it, when you're talking about living in a way where you just go, go, go for 10 to straight hours in a day, not only is it bad for your health, it's, it's just kind of stupid. It's, it's, that, that's not how to get the most out of our time and our body. And, and we want to live in a way that I, I believe kind of works within what science has found about the body but also a way that's biblical. And I'm, well, here's what I mean by that. It's in Psalm 127, verse 2. I, this is an amazing promise. It says, it is useless. This is the second verse. It is useless. Think about that word. 
Like, there's no point. There's no point. It's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. See, rest is a gift from God. Sleep is a gift from God. And to accept that gift is an act of trust. Why is it an act of trust? Think, I want you to think about this. Because we, we tend to overload our schedules and think that we don't have time to get the proper amount of rest or the proper amount of sleep. I, I just, I got to get this thing done. I got to get this last thing done or whatever. Rest and sleep is the ultimate form of trusting God. Because we're like, I'm, I'm going to give up control of getting something accomplished. I'm, I'm going to give up so much control that I'm going to go into this unconscious state of resting, of sleeping, trusting that God is restoring my energy and what I need in this time of sleep. It, it's, we trust God to sustain us while we sleep and when we wake up. It's the ultimate form of trusting God. And, and rest is such a gift from God that he gave us sleep, and he gave us, he gave us this other tangible gift called the Sabbath. God gave us the gift of sleep and the gift of Sabbath to help our bodies rest. And here, here's what Jesus says about this thing called Sabbath, Then I'll explain what it is, kind of how it works. It says, then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. It's saying that this thing called Sabbath, I'll explain it in a second, it's a gift from God too. It's not like you better do this or else. It's a, like God's offering this, why wouldn't we take this you know, in the rhythm of our week? But so many of us, myself included, we reject this gift. And here's what it is. Sabbath is taking one day a week to rest our bodies and our minds. Not that we don't do anything on Sabbath and we just sit in a chair like I can't, you know, I've got a Sabbath here. No, we, we, but we just, we don't work, you know, at our, our normal job or whatever. And this is how I kind of think of it. We don't do anything unless it fits into three categories, faith, family, or friends. It's a day of rest mind, body, and, and just filling it with faith, family, and friends. And, and Sabbath is not something we have to do. It's something that God says, don't do, right? I mean, it's a gift. It, we, we can't think of Sabbath as just another thing to add. Sabbath is it's permission to not do. And although we, in our culture, we have to be intentional with it, or we're not going to, like if I say, oh, I'll try to do Sabbath this week, it ain't going to happen. It's something we have to be intentional with, but it's, 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 a, it's not like something we have to accomplish. It's about letting go of the word accomplish and work and, and progress for that day to refresh and equip for another week. Because God created our minds and bodies, and the science even backs this up. God created our minds and bodies to work best in the rhythm of six days on, one day off. Six days on, one day off. God even operated this way. When he created the universe, he created in six days. He rested on the seventh day. If, if God, all-powerful, all-present God, he, if he operated that way, how much more d- does that need to be the rhythm of our bodies, our minds? And again, just like sleep, Sabbath is an act of trust. Sabbath is a way to say, God, I know you can do more with six days of my week than I could ever do by myself with seven. So I'm giving you this day. I believe that you created this thing to to help me. So I'm giving you this day as a Sabbath, knowing that you can accomplish more in just six of my days than I could ever do by myself with seven. God created us, the human body, to have rest. And I just want to end with three of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. And, And this is what a life of following Jesus looks like. Now, for many of us, there's areas where we would say, it doesn't look like that for me right now. Um, And I would say, if it doesn't look like this in that area, it's probably because we're not following Jesus 100% in that area. And I mean, I'm pointing to myself here with this as well. But this is the life of of following Jesus. This is what he offers. If you're not a follower of Jesus in the room, just think about this is the gift Jesus wants to give us. It's in Matthew 11. It says, come to me. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's our word. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, God wants what is best for us. He wants us to live this life and and just experience these verses. 
And if we're not, I mean, just think about it. Is there something in that area where we're not experiencing that lightened yoke, that rest? Is is there some areas we're not following Jesus there? We need exercise and movement, and we need rest. Let me pray for us. God, both of these are counterintuitive against our nature. Sometimes we like uh, what we want is not often these things. So help us to live by that principle of most over now. What do I want most over now? God, this is a gift you've given our church. This is a gift you've given Christ followers. This is a gift that you, you are offering to those that haven't accepted you. So just speak that truth. Speak the truth of this to anyone that doesn't know you today. And I pray this in your name. Amen.